Hi, I am Melissa Katie. I'm an independent anesthesiologist and my business name is Painless Wellness. And I wanted to just kind of give you a basic play-by-play -play for the day of anesthesia at Stonegate Surgery Center for general anesthesia. So regardless of what kind of procedure, I'm gonna go into a couple tangents depending on certain uh, requirements or situations where certain things might be used or done or not done. But typically the surgery center will call you a day before, or if it's over the weekend, they'll call you Friday for a Monday procedure and let you know what time to show up. Typically it's an hour to hour and a half in advance of your surgical time because there's several things that need to be done. And when they'll let you know about the policies as well, as far as, um, you know, what to do, what not to do. The most important thing from my standpoint is that you don't eat for at least eight hours prior to surgery. I would personally just pick the time they tell you to be there and use that as your time for solid food to not have. So if they say to be there at six, I would just say 10 p.m. the night before, don't eat anything after that time frame. Now, during that eight hour time frame, uh, you can have water and I encourage you to stay hydrated because that will help with the nurse uh, trying to place an IV for you the next morning. Um, if you wake up at five and you have a seven o'clock case, you could use that seven o'clock surgery time when it comes to the water. I'm a little bit more forgiving um, if you are um, just around the two hour mark uh, with water. Solid food, of course, eight hours plus for sure. Um, the reason I tell you to go by the time to be there is because if you're the second or third patient and we're running early, I don't want to have to worry about waiting on that eight hour mark. So most important thing is that for eight hours plus you were not, have not eaten by the time I take you back for surgery. Now the water you can have during those eight hours. Um, but if you're like that very first case in a super early and you need to be there at six and you wake up at five and your surgery's at seven, go ahead and, you know, have a little glass of water at 5 a.m., but get it down right then um, so that you have those two hours for uh, letting your stomach empty. So they'll have you show up at the waiting room. Uh, they'll ask for your information for whoever's going to pick you up, whether they stay there or leave or come back. Um, they need to have that contact information. Once you're in the waiting room and they grab you from there to get you into the pre-op area, they'll bring you into one of the bays. They'll give you a plastic bag to put your belongings in when you change out of your clothes into a gown, but they'll check your blood pressure, heart rate, and all of that. And then they'll check your consent forms, make sure everything looks accurate. And then they'll go ahead and start a small IV. It doesn't need to be a big IV, just something reliable. Typically they'll go to the hand or the forearm. If they can't find anything good there, then they might go to the elbow. That would be fine. I can work with that. Um, the size of the IV is the size we put in children. So it's not a very large IV, but that will need to be placed. Of course, if you have long hair, go ahead and put it in a ponytail bun at the top. It's easier for me to deal with, depending on the position that you'll be in for whatever surgery you're having, whether you're going to be face down, face up, there's various ways that surgeries can occur. So best if you can just put a ponytail bun on top, um, make sure there's no metal. We don't want any metal in your body. Piercings, if they're hard to get out, do the best best you can and really we prefer you just have them all out any belongings that are important to you your rings go ahead and take them off and so you don't bring them to the surgery center um, the reason for not wanting metal is that cautery is a way to help minimize bleeding during surgery and the electrical current can hypothetically go to the areas of the metal and burn the skin where the metal is so just keep that in mind um, but as far as the hair ponytail bun at the top for the long haired um, patients. Otherwise, we do have a disposable bonnet we let you put on um, to cover your hair before going back to the operating room. Of course, I'll come say hi. There'll be a different nurse called the circulating nurse that'll come say hi. We ask similar questions on purpose, um, not to annoy you, but just make sure we have consistent answers. And then also, of course, the surgeon will come by and say hi and do whatever they need to do or um, discuss anything that needs to be dealt with before we go back to the surgery or to the operating room. So once we're ready to go back, I'll give you a little IV margarita or I'll give it to my nurse to give to you depending on the timing. And so we'll get you back to the room. We'll get all the monitors on, let you breathe some oxygen. And then once I'm happy with the setup through the IV, I'll give you additional medicine to get you fully asleep. Now remember the medicine we gave in the pre-op area to the operating room, even though you feel like when you look back on it that you were knocked out, everyone is awake going to the operating room. It's just hard for people to understand because they don't remember it, but it's like being really drunk and not remembering what you did. And that's essentially that sedation that goes going back to the operating room. But once I give the medicine in the IV after the monitors are on in the operating room, that is what's called general anesthesia, meaning you're unconscious. Now, depending on situations, certain situations, there's one of two airway devices that are typically used for a general anesthetic. 
One will be a regular breathing tube, which can be used like in special cases like nose procedures. We're worried about anything that drains the back. We don't want to get to the lungs. Any cases that are extre extremely long, when you start getting to three, four hours or longer, less concern and worry. We, we don't want to have as much worry about your airway. Um, the other device is called an, a laryngeal mask airway. It's a soft plastic device. It just slips behind your tongue. I place that gently. And that's not the kind that goes between the vocal cords. So I would use that in cases where you're only on your back during surgery um, and not very, very long cases. And I have access to your face. Now, if you are face down for certain procedures, of course, that's another reason to have a regular breathing tube. And these are all for safety reasons. So depending on what was gonna be done during surgery, those are one of two devices. A scratchy throat might be um, possible with a regular breathing tube, maybe for a day or two, usually in this little notch area here. Um, when it comes to the little airway device behind, maybe a little sore throat in the back, but it's not usually a significant issue. Uh, if you have large tonsils, it might irritate those areas a little bit more than someone else who has not significant tissue back there. So once you're asleep and one of those devices is placed, um, the numbing medicine is typically used in the areas that are having surgery. If you're having any kind of procedures on the uh, chest or belly, highly suggest taking a Q-tip to clean out your belly button, especially if it's a deep one, uh, at least once, maybe about a week before um, surgery. You don't have to do that very often, but a lot of times uh, there's skin that sloughs off over the months and years, and people don't necessarily see that, and the nurse does have to clean that out very carefully. So feel free to go ahead and clean that out on your own and make the job a little easier for the nurse. Um, otherwise, um, if you do have a long procedure that's going to be multiple hours, or if it's like a tummy tuck, uh, a very long procedure, like definitely four hours or more for sure. Uh, if it's a tummy tuck or sometimes when you're face down and uh, face up, certain procedures we might be placing a catheter in the bladder that's placed by the circulating nurse after your sleep and taken out usually before you wake up. So those things, uh, if you do have a catheter to your bladder, you just might feel, it might feel a little irritated when you first uh, urinate afterwards, um, but that's typically not a, a huge complaint or a problem, but just so you are aware, it all makes sense. Now, once the procedure is done, numbing medicine's in place, I'll already have given anywhere from three to four different anti-nausea medicines, like I mentioned. So that's already working on board. Those medicines typically work six to 12 hours from the ones I give you. And like I tell people, when you first wake up from anesthesia, that's the most drunk you're gonna be, and it just gets better from there. So those medicines that I give through the IV are very effective at helping you with that day of surgery for the anesthesia. And so you shouldn't have a need for anything in recovery room. Like I said, less than a percent of my patients will need anything in recovery room when it comes to nausea. And when everything is done, I turn off the, the gas that you're breathing through a, the tube, whichever device you have, uh, you'll naturally wake up within 10 to 30 minutes afterwards. And usually in recovery room, depending on the length of the surgery, it could be anywhere from an hour to two hours. The longer the case, the longer the exposure anesthesia, the longer for the recovery time, and just every individual is a little bit different. So if you have any questions from this play-by-play, -play, feel free to replay it if you want to. Um, there's other things that we can discuss, um, but if you have questions, feel free to bring that up during our anesthesia consult or our anesthesia pre-op chat, and I'll be happy to address them. And I look forward to taking care of you.